All right, everybody. Good afternoon. I think we can get started. Thank you all for uh, coming out. My name is uh, Nir Izakovic. I'm the uh, director of the Applied Ethics Center. Welcome to our uh, spring symposium of the philosophy department uh, and the Applied Ethics Center. Uh, and the symposium and the talk later and the whole day is uh, celebrating and honoring uh, Professor Glenn Lowry's work from uh, Brown University. I'm sorry that I have a gash on my head. I bumped into a shelf in an attempt to prove that this is being run by an absent-minded philosopher. <laughs> so if you didn't believe it until now, it's true, but um, it's nothing serious. Um, I will um, economize a little bit on the introductions uh, so as to maximize uh, time for uh, the actual uh, discussion. Glenn Lowry is the Merton Stoltz Professor of the Social Sciences, Professor of Economics, and Professor of International and Public Affairs at Brown. He's taught before at Harvard, Northwestern, um, the University of Michigan, BU. Um, he has a BA in Mathematics from Northwestern and a PhD in Economics from uh, MIT. He's one of the country's uh, leading economists and one of the country's leading uh, uh, public intellectuals. Um, David Lyons uh, will be our first panelist, Professor Emeritus of Law and Philosophy at uh, BU. Uh, <coughs> has written many important uh, books in moral and political uh, philosophy from the work of uh, John Stuart Mill to um, a more recent work on uh, uh, historical injustices in this country. And on a personal note, uh, my uh, mentor and teacher and uh, PhD thesis advisor, uh, Dana Miranda is a doctoral student, a fourth year doctoral student at UConn, focusing on both uh, questions of uh, mental health and uh, depression and the philosophy, uh, uh, philosophical questions associated with, what, with that and questions about uh, memorialization, public memory, uh, public monuments. Dana, I'm uh, pleased to say, was just appointed as a uh, fellow at the Applied Ethics Center and will help us develop our uh, public memory project. So thank you, uh, Dana. <laughs> Frank Cooper uh, is a friend and colleague from Suffolk, where I uh, used to work. Frank uh, is a professor of law. Frank Rudy Cooper is a professor of uh, law at uh, Suffolk University, uh, has done uh, really groundbreaking work on uh, questions around uh, black masculinity, the editor of a recent book around that, in addition to um, numerous um, articles uh, and uh, uh, law review uh, articles. And uh, Rajani Srikanth is uh, the Dean of our Honors College and a professor uh, of English, as well as an affiliated faculty with uh, our human rights program, uh, and the author of uh, several award-winning uh, books, including uh, uh, Constructing Empathy, Empathy and Antipathy in U.S. Literature and Law, and The World Next Door, South Asian American Literature and the Idea of America. So the way we'll proceed is uh, each of our panelists will uh, comment for uh, around uh, 10 minutes or so, if possible. Professor Lowry uh, will uh, respond at the end. Uh, and then with the time remaining, uh, we'll open it up to questions. So with that, thank you, Professor Lowry. Thank you to all the panelists. And I look forward to this. So my charge, I can't comment on Professor Lowry's lecture, which hasn't yet been given. So my charge has been to comment on his Lee lecture at Oxford two years ago. And the reason it's reasonable to do that because although the title of the Lee lecture doesn't, I'm sorry, are we on? Okay. Um, the title of the le lecture, which I forget, doesn't explain the overlap, but there's a considerable overlap between um, the title of the lecture for today, The Persistence of Racial Equality in the United States, and uh, the content of that lecture. So it may be useful to, for me to review some of the main threads of that lecture that are relevant today and uh, offer some comments on them. And that's what I'll set out to do. In that lecture, Professor Lowry said, 
The subordinate position of blacks in the economy derives from our stigmatized status in society. This means, roughly, I think, that many Americans see blacks, by and large, as less talented and less trustworthy than whites. That's a, moral, that's a racial stigma and makes it seem rational to discriminate against blacks in distributing resources, in admitting students, and in hiring employees. Professor Lowry, as I understand it, calls that developmental bias, development bias. Professor Lowry holds that racial stigma is not entirely groundless, as I understand it. He refers to a vicious circle, which seems to go as follows. Deprivation and denial leads to denied development, which provides a rational basis for further deprivation, which leads to more intensely denied developments, and so on. The question I want to raise first is, <clears throat> how did this vicious circle arise in America? I would explain it as follows. And this is my explanation, not Professor Lowry's. Jamestown, Virginia, was the first permanent English colony in America, mainland America. In colonial Virginia, as in England, wealth and political power were concentrated in the hands of the large landowners. Within a decade of the, con of the colony's founding in 1607, tobacco became a major cash crop. It really saved the colony for export. Tobacco was produced by indentured servants from Europe, not by African slaves. It has often been said that chattel slavery began on the mainland, in the English colonies, that is, in 1619, when, as it was reported, 20-odd Africans came off a Dutch ship. They were traded for provisions for that Dutch ship. It's a mistake to regard chattel slavery as having begun then, for several reasons. First, slightly legalistic reason, there was no basis in English law or English colonial law for slavery at the time. There hadn't been for many generations, nor even for serfdom. Um, second, we actually know nothing about the fates of those 20-odd Africans who came off that Dutch ship. The, record, the historical records don't tell us what happened to them. Third, we know that during the colony's first 50 years, um, some Africans were held as slaves without legal authorization. We also know that some Africans became indentured servants. We know that from the historical record. For example, when they sued for freedom after their terms of service had been expired. Fourth, we know that indentured servants were treated as commodities. They could be traded, bartered, sold, and so on. So the fact that Africans were traded for provisions doesn't show that they were, in fact, legally slaves. During the Virginia colony's first 50 years, relations between blacks and whites were, in fact, fluid. Some African Americans, as they now could be called, I think, acquired land of their own, economic independence, and social standing. And as a result, as a result, partly of friendly arrangements that they made as individuals with some of the white colonists, there were some interracial marriages. It wasn't against the law. We also know how and why the colony changed, how the vicious circle began. Around 1650, Virginia landowners began to seek slaves to meet their labor needs in producing tobacco. Fewer Europeans were willing to become indentured servants under the conditions that prevailed at the time in the colonies where indentured servants had a mortality rate during their servitude of about 50%. 
It was pretty bad. Um, the existing slave trade, in which the English were major participants and were to become the leading participants, made Africans available. Although slavery still lacked legal authorization in the colony, Virginia planters bought Africans and held them as slaves until circumstances led the colonial government to legally authorize the practice of slavery, which happened gradually, but the main step was 1682, not 1619. In 1675, this is part of the story, white and black workers, current or former indentured servants, each seeking a plot of land and economic independence, rebelled together against the colonial government for reasons I could explain, but I'm not going to take the time right now, because its policies favored the large landowners. The rebellion failed within a year, but it taught the ruling elite a lesson. The Virginia legislature created a system of chattel slavery which had not existed before that specifically limited slavery to people of color. That was the introduction of race-based slavery in Virginia. It's explicit in the legislation. The legislature, the legislature also greatly intensified and expanded discriminatory laws against free blacks, for example, by prohibiting and punishing interracial marriages. Historians agree that the aim of this new legislation was to divide poor whites and poor blacks so that however exploited white workers, white endangered servants might be, their social status would always be higher than that of blacks. The aim was to discourage the kind of cooperation between white and black workers that led to Bacon's rebellion in 1675, the most serious colonial rebellion in the history of the English colony. So the vicious circle and racial inequality did not begin with either deprivation or denial or stigma. It began with the desire for profit and the desire on the part of those who mainly profited to maintain their expanding wealth by retaining political control of the colony. The new laws drove many free blacks to leave the colony. The new laws prevented the development of the talents of those African Americans who remained, as well as their freedom and economic independence. The new laws imposed deprivation and created a secure foundation for racial stigma. The ide its ideological effects are reflected, for example, in Thomas Jefferson's notes on the state of Virginia, his writings on African Americans, which reflect the racial stigma that has since prevailed. That, of course, was 100 years odd years later than the creation of race-based slavery in Virginia. The legal entrenchment of racial subordination was reproduced throughout the colonies and a century later was reinforced by the US Constitution. That's another long story, but it's well developed in the historical literature. Race-based slavery and racially discriminatory laws and social practices promoted stigma by promoting a culture in which racial subordination was seen as natural as new generations arose under those circumstances. When slavery was abolished, abolished after the Civil War, a century later, the egalitarian reforms of congressional reconstruction were effectively blocked by white, white supremacists and an indifferent federal government. So reconstruction was aborted, essentially. It was abandoned within 10 years. The southern states then, with the acquiescence of the federal government, created a new system of racial subordination, which we've come to know as Jim Crow, which continued the vicious cycle of deprivation and denied development until the present day. 
As a result, many African Americans, having been denied equal education and equal opportunity, became less qualified. Now I think on continuing Professor Lowry's story. Became less qualified than many whites for advanced education and demanding jobs. The civil rights reforms of the 1960s did little to undermine the racial stigma by redistributing resources so as to promote the widespread development of African Americans' talents and qualifications. It made a dent, but a dent. Why it's called a second reconstruction because the second reconstruction, like the first, has essentially been abandoned by the federal government. And we can see that most recently in some of the legislation of the states that the Supreme Court has upheld. And in the, uh, the effects it had on the Voting Rights Act, for example. Um, here, I think, is where the second theme of Professor Lowry's Lee Lecture becomes relevant. It, become, it concerns the massive, disproportionate incarceration of young black men. Professor Lowry asks whether the punitive control of millions of young black men is, in his words, quote, a necessary evil given the need to maintain order, or is an abhorrent expression of who we have become as a people at the dawn of the 21st century, end quote. Professor Lowry says that nothing in the data or in empirical social science can help us decide. I'll say a little more about this later. He does not mention that the legal system is grossly distorted by policies that imprison many young black men who should not be in prison, either because they have not broken the law or because many of those laws that might be justified are unjustly applied. Professor Lowry refers in his Lee Lecture to a malignant barbarism in our midst, that's his words, and seems to say with those words that they are persons whose violence and gratuitous cruelty understandably leads to their imprisonment. But he also says that they are at the same time properly valued, and I can't disagree with this, as members of black families and their larger communities. Professor Lowry addresses these concerns because the conduct of the relevant subset of young black men and its legal consequences reinforced the racial stigma. That's part of the story. Young black men are seen by many whites as dangerous and African Americans are seen by many whites as undesirable neighbors and co-workers. So the vicious cycle continues. Professor Lowry holds that young black men who cause fear and harm in their communities are personally accountable for the choices that they make, but the solution is not increased incarceration, which he says causes crime. Again, agreed. He rejects the notion that young black men are inherently criminal. Again, agreed. He holds rather that American society is responsible for the social conditions that create deprivation. It's responsible for the inadequate schools, for the lack of opportunity, I'll add for the inordinate stress, both mental and physical, to which African Americans are subjected and for discouraging constructive motivation. America is reaping what it has sown. I'll add three comments, three further comments. First, although I've suggested that economic factors help explain the creation of racial subordination and racial inequality in the United States, going back to early Virginia, I also believe it would be a mistake to understand the subordinate position of African Americans in purely economic terms. Political and social exclusion have economic consequences, but they are not economic in nature, and their significance is not exhausted by their economic consequences. The same applies to physical and mental health. They are not economic conditions, 
and their importance is not exhausted by their economic consequences. I hope that Professor Lowry would agree. Second, I believe that factors other than racial stigma help to explain the persistence of racial equality in the United States. The creation of the urban ghetto is partly a result of racial exclusion and stigma, but it also re reflects a source of profit for landlords and realtors, and always has. Third, I believe Professor Lowry exaggerates the openness of the theoretical choice he poses when he says that nothing in the data, nothing in empirical social science can tell us whether the mass incarceration of young black men is a necessary evil or an abhorrent expression of what we have become as a people. My point is simply that data alone rarely, if ever, decides between competing explanations in physics as well as in the social sciences. The best supported theory is generally identified, I think, by what's called an inference to the best explanation. I believe that Professor Lowry has made that inference. Hello. Hello, everyone. Um, good afternoon. First off, I wanted to say um, thank you for attending. I'm proud and happy to be on this panel. I'm glad to see old and new friends um, here. Um, so my presentation, um, again, wants to start off by looking at the history of where does this phrase Black Lives Matter come about and really building upon Glenn Lowry's work in the Lee Lecture, as well as his 2015 works. Um, so Black Lives Matter versus, in quotes, Black Lives Matter, um, as well as the political inefficacy um, of Black Lives Matter, of saying Black Lives Matter. So looking at the history of this work, of this theme, of this saying, of this movement, one thing um, that Glenn Lowry actually quotes is Khalil Muhammad's work, The Condemnation of Blackness. And in the Lee Lecture, um, it, it really focuses on what the question of emancipation was also a question of these new freed individuals, these new freed black men, how are they going to be citizens in our republic? And in Muhammad's work, he traces how that question was met with criminalization, was met with penalties, was met with imprisonment, um, what we now call today a prison industrial complex. So from the very start of emancipation, um, we have the question of what citizenship means for black individuals and it being met with criminality, being met with this sense of deviance that uh, Glenn Lowry also talks about. And what's particularly encouraging about the Lee Lecture is that Glenn Lowry carefully traces and articulates the point that if we think of the crimes, whether black on black crime or just the very everyday attitudes and life situations of people, of color in this country as deviants, as something pathological, as a bad trait that just needs to be worked out with hard work. What is left out of that equation is that we also have social and political responsibilities to change this condition. And so in Lowry's work, he really wants to focus that deviance is not the proper way of looking at the situation, but rather let's look at, in his own terms, socioeconomic structures, um, and if we can use that as our framework, looking at the structures that people find themselves in, then the question becomes, um, well, Black Lives Matter, is this saying effective? Is this an actual effective movement? And in Lowry's own work, he talks about the difference um, between racial justice and greater social justice or universal policies or comprehensive reform. But for me, what I find most encouraging in Lowry's Lee Lecture is the particular quote when he talks about the thug's well-being. How do we actually articulate the life and worth of black lives in this country? So if we are looking at it from a historical question, we can see the denigration and the subordination of black individuals in this country. That the question of the worth of Black Lives Matter or of black lives, we can trace from Anna Julia Cooper really saying, what are we worth? 
if the question of black people disappearing from the earth, will we lose anything of significance? Well, Anna Julia Cooper says we would lose a lot. Now, if we're talking about the worth of Black Lives Matter, if we're really trying to articulate a thug's well-being in this climate, one, we can trace the historical causes and root, or root causes, as Lowry likes to state, about how did we get to the point where in our society today, we're not a shining city upon the hill, where rather we face situations and structures where certain segments of the population are denigrated and subordinated, that can be killed without repercussion. So this moves on to the second point. So if Lowry really wants to show that the situations that black people face in the country are not matters of deviance, but really are causally rooted with one's socioeconomic structure, the second aspect then becomes, well, how do we address it? How do we really go about changing things effectively? And so one of the things that actually examining um, the movement for black lives is that their structure is what's called decentralized. It's a horizontal form of leadership and politics where there, are not, there isn't a central leader. There's no Martin Luther King Jr., there's no Malcolm X. And even though we can point to the founders of the saying Black Lives Matter, Patricia Colors, um, Alicia Garza, and Opal Tometi, even their own interactions with the movement in 2018, they don't actually have a connection with actual Black Lives Matter organizations on the ground. So there are many chapters, um, 60 chapters around the world, with the name Black Lives Matter. But when we look at the larger picture, at the larger movement, well, the movement for black lives consists of organizations such as Firebird, Asada's Daughters, um, Ferguson October, which changed its name recently to Ferguson Uprising. And all these organizations are working together, but in their own leadership, there's not one central leader, one central statement that you can say, hey, this is their actual um, reasoning. This is what they actually want to accomplish. The closest we actually get to that is a platform that was released that's the Movement for Black Lives vision. And so although they have six central platforms, what I really want to articulate and emphasize is that when we have this form of leadership that really tries to make um, everyone a leader, and this is why Patrice Coulors calls it a leaderful model, and <laughs> Some people call it a leaderless model, I will say that. Um, I'll put that out there. But a leaderful model really seeks to make every individual associated with the movement not only leaders where they can be actionable, and by that I mean they can create action, they can create political change so long as they will it, um, but also it's focused on, again, this aspect of well-being. And so to go back to Lowry's work, when we really ask, our question, uh, ask the question, what is a thug's worth? What do we actually care about the well-being of individuals, even individuals that commit violence in our communities and outside our communities? For me, Black Lives Matter very grounds that intentionally in their practices. So not only do they have wellness centers, um, but they really focus on working with the individual to get them to a state of wellness. And so Patrice Colors in her autobiography, when they call us a terrorist, she states that the very work we're doing in this movement has to be centered on wellness. Because if you, if we, the people working to change structures, don't care about the very humanity of the people we're, we're fighting for and with, then something's wrong in our practice. If I'm going into communities just to be the leader, to enact my vision, then how am I, in a sense, losing focus about that person's well-being? So this is why Black Lives Matter um, the movement states very art forcefully that all black lives matter. It doesn't matter religious, sexual orientation, um, beliefs. It doesn't really matter whether you're a criminal, whether you're the thug in the city. If we're really focused on all black lives mattering, then we have to be focused in our own practices of making sure we're dealing with emotional health, um, wellness, social support. And for me, that's a radical vision of what society should look like and how do we actually get there. So it's very much intentionally grounded in black feminist practices, um, such as the Kahambi River Collective, where the individuals state that 
if the work we're doing is violent in and of itself, if we, in order to get free, we commit violence, there's something going on wrong in our movement. And so when I look at Black Lives Matter and I really study the organizations and not, not just the leaders that you hear about, but the actual people on the ground about how they're working to situate wellness and freedom together, for me the question, again, goes back to Lowry's work. Is what um, Black Lives <laughs> Matter, the organization, the social movement doing, is it actually effective in creating this new society, a society grounded on freedom and wellness? For me, that is a particular political question that, that you have to deal with in a larger social climate. And in Lowry's 2015 work, the big question then becomes, well, is saying Black Lives Matter, is really articulating and being focused on the particular injustice of police violence being done to black bodies and black people and black communities. Is focusing on that really gonna create a comprehensive universal policy reform that will change a whole entire structure? Or must we do something else? And for me, when I look at ongoing social movements, so 2014 to 2018, it's four years. It's four years old. And the movement has changed. They have um, unleashed protests. Now they've done policy proposals. They've endorsed certain candidates. Some individuals have even run for office. And so this transformation is not a, in a sense, progress being made, like, oh, they're becoming um, more legislative. They're going back to old forms of political power that we know about. But really, for me, if we're really focused on wellness, on achieving a state and society where the wellness of even thugs can be appreciated, can actually be articulated as something as worth that shouldn't be lost, then for me, I'm very interested in, I'm very interested in hearing other people on the panel, especially Glenn Lowry himself, about when we really aim to change socioeconomic structures. If the problems faced by black people aren't problems of deviance that can be changed simply by changing someone's character, how can we then as a collective really envision a structure of society that's grounded in not only wellness, not only freedom, but being able to articulate that black lives do matter? So hi, uh, I'm really pleased that Professor Isakovich, uh, I just knew I, knew I was going to mispronounce it, Isakovich, <laughs> um, invited me to uh, present on this panel. Uh, he was a great colleague at Suffolk, and as I told him, he is missed there. Um, now, the title of this talk is Policing and Masculinities, and the title signals that I am talking about men. And I want to also make it clear that the title signals that I'm talking about police officers as well. But the key to me is that we, in some ways, what I'm calling for is further attention to the fact that although people talk about the policing of black men, I want to focus on the fact that it is largely men who are policing black men. So I want to focus on masculinity. So I propose to hone in on three quotes from Glenn Lowry's thought-provoking piece, When Black Lives Matter, The Ethics of Race, Crime, and Punishment in America, which is the piece that Professor Lyons was referring to and soon to be Professor Miranda was referring to. Um, and uh, what I wanna do is really focus on uh, his assertion that the real problem of race and criminal justice is white's general lack of empathy for blacks, which I believe we're also gonna hear more about. So uh, here are three sort of um, quotes that I'm going to focus on. First, uh, in his piece, he has an opening mantra where he says, uh, here's, there's an economist, and the economist is saying, relations before transactions, relations before transactions, relations before transactions, which, of course, is nonsensical from an economist, usually, right? Um, that is not usually how they think. Um, so I want to focus in on that quote. Secondly, I want to focus on the part of the piece where he says that prison, in conjunction with other meaningful social structures like welfare, education, employment, mental health, is, quote, 
a site for the reproduction of social stratification. So that's the second quote. And then finally, I'll unpack his claim that whites generally don't empathize with black prisoners because, quote, they have difficulty identifying with the plight of people whom they mistakenly assume to simply be reaping what they have sown. So starting with relations before transactions. So to my mind, this is, um, I guess I am not the economist in this uh, dialogue. And to me, it's, uh, I, it seems, yes, that's, that's clearly so. Um, stigma precedes and constructs material elements of oppression of blacks. And I felt that Professor Lowry did a great job of teasing that out in a way that um, certainly has been in the literature, but maybe hasn't been as articulated uh, as well and as deeply as he does in his lecture. So um, I think as Professor Lyons says, political and social segregation goes beyond economics. And what I want to do is analyze how racism and masculinities combine to create police oppression of black males. And that's going to underscore the primacy of relations. So here's the first part uh, of the sort of substantive talk. So masculinities are hierarchized by race and other identities. One way of thinking about this is to simply say that I'm going to talk about the flip side of gender, masculinities, um, and we could complicate that further. And I want to talk also about the intersectionality of masculinities with other forms of identity like race, sex orientation, class, etc. So the US's hegemonic masculinity has been white. From 1619, though per uh, Professor Lyons, maybe only since 1682, to at least 1954, white supremacy was the official policy of the US. And the racial hierarchy continues to be built into the masculinities hierarchy. The need to protect white women from black men was explicitly given as the reason for criminalizing black men after the Civil War. This was codified in the 19 teens with the film that created the film industry in this country, Birth of a Nation. But the convict lease system, which has already been referenced, had already labeled black men as criminals. And as Professor Miranda says, this criminalization was embedded deep in the structure of US thinking. Fear of black men was a major reason for the creation of ambiguous crimes like disorderly conduct. And uh, I'll just take a brief aside and say, one of the things that I've written about is the fact that uh, one of the foremost crimes that uh, black men in particular get punished for in this country is contempt of cop. And contempt of cop is usually based on disorderly conduct, resisting arrest, which basically means you mouthed off to a cop and instead of killing you, they decided to tag you with some uh, arrest. So um, another sort of part a part that you're not hearing of this talk is talking about the fact that masculinities um, are about competition. And they're about competition in a way that helps explain the criminalization of black men. When the patriarchy was in full effect, black men were white men's most direct competitors. And the history of the 15th Amendment makes that very clear. And the hegemonic white male identity today thus traces its roots to the goal of protecting white women from black men. This is the idea that's in Birth of a Nation. So today, white men may have to actually compete with black men for their women. But the protectionist rationale for the racial hierarchy remains a silent source of white maleness. And I'll step back for a second again and just say this. In the United States, I've identified that a dominant aspect of uh, masculinity is a sort of competitiveness and aggression. It is also a collection of tokens of masculine esteem, right? The, among the major of those being wealth, acclaim, and women, usually in the hegemonic form of masculinity. So, uh, this fight about protecting white women from black men is a fight about uh, how 
uh, white men will feel their masculine esteem. So that's my first point. Second, it's a site for reproduction of social stratification. So here I want to talk briefly about the concept of the centaur state. So the centaur state is a concept from British political theory. So just as the centaur is a man on top and a horse on the bottom, the contemporary neoliberal state is light on the top and hard on the bottom. And by that is meant the state, the neoliberal Western state, has been soft on the top of society, right? Deregulation, tax breaks that shift public goods to the rich, and it's been hard on the bottom. And this, Professor Lowry references, the connection between prison and workfare. And in his uh, little red book, uh, Professor Lowry does talk about the ideas that have been out there uh, uh, that, in a sense, it's sort of prison for the men, workfare for the women. And I want to talk, connect this concept of the centaur state to the idea of the reproduction of social stratification by just referencing uh, what I, I take it uh, Professor Lowry may be referencing, which is Luis Althusser's concept of ideology and ideological state apparatuses. And so Luis Althusser, in, at the end of the 1960s, was explaining Western social relations as capitalist societies have to reproduce not only the means of production, but the relationships between the producers. So, as the character in Caddyshack says, the world needs ditch diggers too. <laughs> and it needs a lot more ditch diggers than it needs doctors. So, uh, my second point here is just that when we think about this sort of reproduction of social stratification, how might that be, uh, how might it be that masculinity is playing into that? So my third point is to look at the quote, they, must, they have difficulty identifying with the plight of people whom they mistakenly assume to simply be reaping what they have sown. So here I want to talk about um, some ideas that were recently pitched by uh, Professor Joanna Schwartz of uh, UCLA's law school. She has a great idea. She says, look at the challenger destruction, right? When the challenger went up into the air, uh, you know, I was one of the kids that was watching TV while it blew up, right? So uh, what did we do? What we said was, at first, we just blamed a bunch of individuals. But eventually, what we said was, the system failed. And what we have to fix is the system. Don't fix blame, fix the system. In uh, the medical profession, there's an increasing focus on systems analysis. And that systems analysis says, Let's not worry so much about blaming doctors or anybody other individual for the uh, outcomes that we don't want, patient deaths, patient sickness. Let's instead look at the system and see how we can fix it. And in both cases, what they do are things like in aviation, they have a checklist of what the pilots have to go through. And because the pilots have to go through that, they sometimes catch errors that otherwise would have been human errors that we would have affixed blame on an individual for. And in medicine, they've created a number of systems whereby anybody, uh, med tech, nurse, doctor, can uh, point out and sometimes has to point out oh, this patient was supposed to be left arm in the chart, but we're drawing a line on their right arm. What's going on? So she says, why not look at policing this way as a systems failure? And I'm going to give a reason why not to. The reason why not to is what would gum up a systems failure analysis of policing? The fact that most people don't care. Right? Let's, let's be honest here. Right? Most whites, or at least the sort of majority who's voting right now, do not care about what's going on in the hood, specifically when it's police officers harassing young men of color. And uh, so to my mind, just trying to take a systems analysis is not going to work here because the relations are before the transactions. We are going to have to fix the stigma before we would have the collective will to fight 
for a systems analysis of policing of men of color. And I think that my closing point here is don't take attention off the racism. Don't take attention off the stigma, uh, as Professor Lowry has been talking about. If we take attention off of that, we come up with ideas that are really neat, right? Like doing a systems analysis of policing where we would say, we're not worried about the dead body in the street that the police officer shot. Instead, we're going to figure out like what would reduce that. What if police officers had fewer encounters with drivers? Maybe that would be a system solution Professor Schwartz was suggesting. I love that idea, except that I think that there has to be a political will, and there won't be a political will as long as there's a lack of empathy. So uh, I have some comments about BLM, but I'll leave them be. I want to uh, make one last comment. Um, a last quote, which I was going to include here, was that Professor Lowry says, I have joined my lived experience to my scholarship and my politics. And I think that is uh, impressive and is part of the fuel of the uh, insights that you've been giving recently. So I hope to join you in wedding my uh, experience and my scholarship. Thank you. Um, so let me start by actually thanking Professor Nir Isaacovitz. Did I say that right? Yeah for um, inviting me to respond to Dr. Lowry's paper and to be part of this panel. I really appreciate this. It also gives me an opportunity to connect with my colleagues who I sometimes don't see on campus for months at a time, so I really appreciate that, yeah. Um, I wanna start by bringing in the voice of a writer who's been very much in the news and in sort of the public imagination since Black Lives Matter and more so since the release of the film, I Am Not Your Negro. And I bet you all know that I'm talking about James Baldwin, okay? Um, so let me start by having you look at a quote from his uh, book, The Fire Next Time, which was published in 1963. If we, and now I mean the relatively conscious whites and the relatively conscious blacks, who must, like lovers, insist on or create the consciousness of others, do not falter in our duty now. We may be able, handful that we are, to end the racial nightmare and achieve our country and change the history of the world. I mean, I'm extraordinarily struck by the optimism of that sentiment, which rings true even today, so many years later. Now, there are two parts of this utterance that I want to draw your attention to. The word conscious and the phrase like lovers. Now, conscious, um, I'm sure the philosophers have a lot to say about that. But as a person from literary studies, conscious to me means to be aware both of the self and of the other to be keenly attuned to one's own feelings and those of the other, to be open to new sensations, to be responsive. Baldwin was exhorting both whites and blacks to be heightened in their awareness of the world around them. I would say that today that exhortation must be directed to the group which holds power. Can this group, that frames the laws, that builds the prisons, that constructs the policies on housing, can this group, almost overwhelmingly white, be conscious of the impact of its institutional structures, and can it feel the pain of those whose lives it contains and organizes and, dare I say, destroys? And this is something that Professor Lowry says in his Lee lecture as well. Right? Now let me turn to the phrase, like lovers. Baldwin's use of this phrase is a crucial reminder that if we are to live together meaningfully, then we must commit to intimacy in our struggles through this world. We cannot live in segregated neighborhoods. We cannot socialize in monoracial and monoethnic groups. We cannot walk away from examining the messy consequences of our own words and actions. We cannot refuse to examine the ways in which those of us who are the beneficiaries of power 
are the beneficiaries of power. Permit me a small digression. Some of you know that I actually spend a fair amount of time in South Africa. Um, I've been going there since 2006. And I find South Africa a fascinating country because it's a relatively new democracy and one that's struggling through all of the things that you know, new democracies struggle through in attempting to forge a society of multiracial peoples. Um, South Africa has taught me a lot and I wanna try to bring some of those insights into this conversation. So Tristan Ann Borer, who's actually, I believe, down in Connecticut, um, Connecticut College, writing about the South African Truth and Reconciliation Commission, goes through a useful exercise of listing all of the ways in which the apartheid regime created numerous categories of perpetrators and victims. Among those who were perpetrators, she identifies the architects of the apartheid regime, those who articulated the system that organized life and society on the basis of race. Then she identifies the implementers, the foot soldiers, so the police force, the South African military, the judiciary, these implementers who violated the human rights of black South Africans. Next, she identifies the bystanders who knew what was transpiring and who simply watched and did nothing to challenge the gross violations of the apartheid regime. And finally, the beneficiaries who may have known nothing of the particulars of how the apartheid structures were maintained, either through willful ignorance or because they were so insulated from the particulars. But among the beneficiaries, essentially all white South Africans who received better education, better health services, better land, better employment, better opportunities, better access, better, better, better. Whatever the shortcomings of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, and there are many, and that would take an entire other lecture, um, it forced white South Africans to hear and confront the numerous ways in which either knowingly or unknowingly, directly or indirectly, they had benefited from apartheid. They were given a lesson in power and privilege. In any relationship, whether personal or institutional, it is always hard for those in positions of power to see their power and to acknowledge it. Power blinds because power does not need to see. One more point about South Africa and its relevance to understanding racial equality here, and that is law. The apartheid regime was very careful to construct laws that upheld its ideology. The Group Areas Act that led to the PASS laws, Mixed Marriages Act that led to laws against interracial unions. As we all know, laws give the impression of rationally made and carefully constructed decisions. The focus on the procedural and technical aspects of laws is designed to hide the power asymmetries that give particular groups advantage in constructing laws. Mahmoud Mamdani, who is a um, fairly well-known South African African theorist calls it the fetishizing of law, and this is what we do. Hide behind laws that eviscerate particular communities, as Professor Lowry has pointed out in his Lee lecture, incarcerations that break up families and destroy communities. Samira Esmeyer, who's both a literary critic and a legal scholar, warns against the allure of law. She warns against the fact that juridical attention to human rights is insufficient and asks us to think about what it really means to be committed to the struggle. How do we engage? How do we immerse ourselves in truly understanding the pain of others? And how do we understand what it means when Judith Butler says that not all lives are deemed grievable? Some lives are deemed more grievable than others. And I just wanted to sort of bring to your attention what Asmeyer says, what is needed is the forging of concrete alliances with human beings who, who await not our recognition, but our participation in their struggles. It should be their struggles, sorry. <laughs> and now I wanna turn to Sarah Schulman, queer theorist, and her observations about solidari solidarity work, ally work. It is difficult work, often unrecognized work, requiring humility 
and the ability to decenter oneself. And I'll just say, you know, Elaine Scarry, who is sort of another philosopher and social commentator, talks about one of the reasons that it's really difficult for us to imagine other people is that it requires us to decenter ourselves in our own imagination. Uh, but let's turn to Sarah Schulman now, and she asks this question. Have you ever been the object of injustice and asked for help? If so, perhaps you experience someone else come along who is privileged and protected. They say they will help, and then they make one gesture, they may send an email, or have one difficult conversation. Then when their own supremacy of self-concept fails to transform an, embed an embedded situation, the person throws up their hands and drops the effort. It's too complicated, or it will just take time, or other banalities get thrown at you as the dilettante moves on to another arena where they will instead be obeyed. I tried, they insist, and then they go back to their comfortable bubble. So for many people, it's actually easier to commit to an idea and to fight for an ethical notion than to fight for flesh and blood people. People can be messy. They may not fit your notion of pristine humanity. They may speak in ways that irk you, you know, the thugs that Professor Lowry talks about. They may make you feel uncomfortable. Ideas are abstractions. Ethics can be ethereal. So I want to just make a small little aside again. Um, a few years ago, I was working with a number of lawyers from the private bar who were representing some of the detainees at Guantanamo Bay. And I started to work with them because I was really interested in why these lawyers, you know, who were making like $400 an hour, sometimes more, had dedicated many, many, many hours of their time to representing the detainees. And fascinatingly enough, um, initially their interest in the detainees came about not because they cared really about the detainees at all, but because they were outraged that a text on which they had built their entire profession, which was the Constitution of the United States, was being disparaged. And so it's more of, we've got to go and stand with this text and show that it matters. So this is how they got involved, right? So one of them, Sabin Willett, actually, um, right here in Boston, I think he, was, he sort of coined the phrase that it wasn't until we met our defendants, it wasn't until we met, went to Guantanamo Bay and met the detainees and knew them as people it was only then that we became radicalized into our own humanity. And it's a powerful phrase when you think about it. What does it mean to be radicalized into one's own humanity? And I think this is the question that Professor Lowry is asking. What does it take for those with power in our society to understand what it means to coexist with others and, like Baldwin might say, to love others? So let me go back to Baldwin again. 1960, and this is a piece from his Fifth Avenue Uptown. Again, you know, I'm struck by the optimism there. The white policeman standing on a Harlem street corner finds himself at the very center of the revolution now occurring in the world. He's not prepared for it, naturally nobody is, and what is possibly much more to the point, he is exposed, as few white people are, to the anguish of black people around him even if he is gifted with the merest mustard grain of imagination, something must seep in. He cannot avoid observing that some of the children, in spite of their color, remind him of children he has known and loved, perhaps even of his own children. Uh, just a remarkable quote for the optimism. We don't know if people have even the mustard grain of imagination. But how do we make ourselves see and feel with love and transcend the harshness and suspicions of our acquired and manufactured emotions? How do we make the choice to be better than what we have absorbed unthinkingly? And how do we dare to be true to humanity? And I'll just end with one last um, quotation, actually a poem from Adrian Rich, or an excerpt from a poem. Uh, very early, I think in the 1950s, I don't know the exact date, Adrian Rich was uh, won the Auden Prize for the Young Poets, okay? And W.H. Auden wrote this sort of congratulatory uh, announcement about it, calling her, um, she was an obedient poet and followed all the rules, okay? So there was a sort of his very patronizing way of saying, you did a good job, and so we're giving you the prize. Well, many years later, Adrian Rich, as you know, decided that to hell with all the rules, she was gonna write poetry that really mattered. And so this is one of her poems. 
the faithful drudging child, the child at the oak desk whose penmanship, hard work, style will win her prizes, becomes the woman with a mission not to win prizes, but to change the laws of history. And I'm sort of remembering how much pressure there is on social scientists to be quantitative, mathematical, to forego the emotional, to forego what really matters. And so I'm saying, give it all up. Go back to the things that really count, as Professor Lowry has said in the closing paragraph of his wonderful speech, where he talks to us as a human being and a scholar. In our classrooms, we should be rejecting safe pedagogies for unquiet pedagogies. And I take that phrase from one of our colleagues, um, Ellie Kutz, whose book has that title, Unquiet Pedagogy. We should allow ourselves, as Rich says, to be gripped by a blue, a foreign air, a desert absolute, to be dragged by the roots of our own will into another scene of choices. Thank you. I'm going to be brief in my response to these uh, remarks from uh, David Lyons, my old colleague from Boston University many years ago, uh, from David Miranda, whose uh, outlook about Black Lives Matter and movement for black lives I appreciate uh, being uh, reminded of and instructed with, and to Frank Cooper, to reflections on masculinity and hierarchy and the intersection of race and Gender dynamics is a welcome addition to this conversation, though, in reference to Althusser, I think you significantly impute to me more philosophical sophistication than I possess. Um, and to uh, Rajini Srikanth, uh, whose literary um, uh, allusions and references put this conversation, I think, uh, appropriately in a, a richer context. I'm going to give a lecture here momentarily. I don't think I need to give one at this moment, but let me, let me just make a few remarks. Um, David Lyons talks in interpreting me of my emphasis on the rationality of stigma in virtue of there being a vicious circle in which the disadvantage of African-American populations manifests itself in ways that observers can then take as justification for their stigmatizing behaviors and views. And I want to focus for a moment on rationality because in my book, The Anatomy of Racial Inequality, I spend some time in the chapter on racial stereotypes interrogating the claim that inferences about African Americans that may seem on the surface to be justified by empirical data, let's say a fear of so-called black crime, justified by the observation that African-American arrest rates for particular kinds of offenses are uh, particularly high. The claim that that is a rational inference needs to be interrogated. Um, I am at some pains indeed to reject at the end of the day the full rationality of such stereotyping inferences and I justify my rejection of the defense. That was a rational inference. What do you want me to do? So say the data. I'm merely following what the data indicate to me by saying, as David has alluded to here, that the data don't resolve all of our problems and they don't speak for themselves. They require to be interpreted. And the data are themselves a product of the ongoing system of relations that are the subject of the critical discourse. So a reference to the data as defense of the rationality of an exclusionary and discriminatory set of practices or institutions uh, is not something that should be taken at face value. In particular, I'm at pains to emphasize that um, whether or not people are prepared to step back from what the data might appear to be telling them when that data runs contrary to some basic commitments that they may have, moral and ethical commitments that they may have, or some basic intuitions that they might have, 
whether they're prepared to step back from the data and say, well, what's going on here really, and can we see what's going on? That that's really very important. I give the example, for uh, instance, of gender differences in the um, sciences where women may be underrepresented in mathematics or physics in numbers. And the response to that disparity is to interrogate the institution. Uh, it has come to be that response. It wasn't always that response, but the latter-day response to the underrepresentation of women in the stem cells or the low numbers of women in the tech uh, firms and whatnot is to say, well, let's look at what we're doing. Well, how, how are we modeling what we do? What, what systems of social interaction within our institutions might be precluding women? What are the role of role models and this kind of thing? The gender disparity has come to cause us to question uh, whether the data are sufficient unto themselves. We want to look behind the data. We want to interrogate our model. We want perhaps to abandon ways of thinking that have become familiar and look for new ways of thinking. And the extent to which a disparity occasions that kind of reaction or not is not a rational calculation, I argue, in the anatomy of racial inequality. Rather, it's a, it's a, a pattern recognition kind of uh, thing. It's a something fits with my intuition or it doesn't fit with my intuition. I'm made comfortable and affirmed by certain ways of thinking or I'm disturbed and disquieted by those ways of thinking. And that's not rationality. Uh, and racial stigma can enter into these cognitive processes in ways that are interesting and are worth examining. That was one point I wanted to make about David's observations. I want to say one more thing about what David Lyons had to say. I think it's a hyperbolic exaggeration to say that the second reconstruction has been abandoned. I say this with due respect and a deference and a recognition of your great learning about the history of race and philosophical ideas that tend that there are two here in the United States. I think the abandonment of the first reconstruction was the abandonment of reconstruction. I think what's being called the abandonment of the second reconstruction is definitely a setback, definitely pushback, definitely something to be uh, struggled against and fought. But it's not the abandonment of it. It's not the repeal of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. It's not an endorsement of the agenda of the white supremacists who sought to preclude the federal government from coming in to the southern states and enforcing uh, civil rights laws and so forth. So I, 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 would, uh, I, I would be disinclined to think of in, in, the, in those terms, or at, at least I'd be cautious about that, because that second reconstruction, such as it was and has been, ain't nothing. It was hard won, again, I don't mean to be patronizing, it was hard won, and uh, you know, it, it, deserves, uh, it deserves its due. Um, I will acknowledge this. The profit motive, uh, historically and in an ongoing way, is definitely a factor in the sustaining of racial disparities. And I, an economist, probably ought to give a great deal more attention to it than I have done in some of my writings. So um, uh, I take the point. Uh, malignant barbarism, I was quoting somebody negatively. I wasn't affirming that it was a malignant barbarism. I was simply saying, this guy's calling it a malignant barbarism. What can you expect people to do if that's how they're thinking? So I, don't, I, I just want not to have that laying out there as if that was the kind of phrase that I might use. Um, okay, Black Lives Matter, why well, say that? Lowry 2015, I think you're referring to a piece I wrote in which I say the problem with saying Black Lives Matter is, or you're from my Boston Review piece? Or? No, so it's that piece and then the advancement you made in the Louis lecture. Yeah. I actually want to connect this comment that I'm about to make uh, to the remarks of uh, Frank Cooper um, as well. Because here's basically the position that I try to defend. Don't say black lives matter. Why am I saying that? Of course black lives matter. Don't say black lives matter if the issue is changing the way that police are trained, the protocols that govern their practices on the street, the accountability to which they're held as a consequence in, in the face of their uh, wrongful actions. Don't say black lives matter. Because the only way we're gonna get those changes, and this could be wrong and I expect pushback, is if one has a sufficiently broad endorsement, they don't care, okay? One has a sufficiently uh, wide embrace of the sense of uh, something being wrong with the practice in the institutions. Now, as it happens, somewhere around 1,200 Americans every year are killed by police officers. About 300 or 350, we could find the exact number of those people are black. 
Uh, the Washington Post, for example, has been publishing uh, periodically a, a, in effect, a census of police killings in which they try to identify every single one of them by searching the available sources and then describe what happens. What's the race of the person killed? What's the race of the police officer? What time of day and under what circumstances was the uh, person killed armed and so forth and so on. And there are a lot of white people on those lists. There are cases of white people being shot by police officers, kid with a toy gun, a person fleeing with their hands up, and everything in between. Every case that you can identify, famous cases of African Americans who have been uh, killed by police officers, you can find parallel cases in which whites have been killed by police officers under similar circumstances. I'm not saying that there's no racial element to police violence in the country. I'm not saying that at all. And of course, the relative rates at which these events are happening are higher in the black population than in the white population. What I'm saying, however, is that if one wants to break, let's say, the Supreme Court's interpretation of police responsibility, where they in effect say it's a subjective judgment, the cop feels that he's in danger of his life, he's justified to shoot. If you want to change that, so that cops actually start getting prosecuted for shooting under circumstances, even those in which a reasonable person might have feared for their lives, we're going to need allies, and we're going to need a, a framing of the problem that's broader than uh, the oppression of African Americans. I want to give another example. A few weeks ago in Chicago, a police commander uh, was gunned down in a stairwell across the street from City Hall in downtown Chicago, and it created a big stir. This is the highest ranking police officer to have been killed in the line of duty in Chicago in decades. It happens, you know, at first I heard that the cop was shot, and then I had to go and try to find out whether the person who shot the cop was black. And all the time I'm hoping that the person wasn't black. I'm hoping that the person wasn't black, but of course the person was black, okay? Um, the black criminal got caught and is now in custody and will be dealt with. Nobody is writing a story saying black thug guns down decent white cop in the streets of Chicago. Now, I'm sure there's some people over the dinner table that are saying that, but nobody is, uh, is framing that publicly in that way, and nor should they, nor should they. On the other hand, if by some accident of fate, the cop had shot first, and the murderer had instead been killed, this would be yet another case to add on to the litany of cases in which b black man gunned down by racist cop. Now here's the point that I'm trying to make. We, progressives, those who want social justice, those who are interested in the well-being of African Americans, oughtn't to be in a hurry to racialize these kinds of encounters and these kind of events. We should be slow to racialize them, not quick to racialize. That should not be the first card that we play. So I'm disquieted a bit by what I could almost take to be the fetishization of race that creeps into some of this advocacy. And in saying that, I'm not yet quite at the point of holding up the banner, we should all be colorblind, race doesn't matter, so forth and so on. And yet, I do want to affirm that that moral principle of transracial humanism, of a sense of the worth of persons quite independent of their race, of the sense of the fact that these uh, 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 characteristics that we identify with our race are relatively superficial vis-a-vis -vis the things that make us human beings and the things that bring us together, or could potentially bring us together, that could be the basis of us loving one another, our humanity is what I speak of, that should be primary. And, that, and that's, that's kind of the, what I want to at least put on the table as a concern about, about um, a movement for black lives. It's a place to start, maybe, but it's not a place to rest, I would say. Um, let me see if I have anything else here. Um, Prison is a site for the social reproduction, the racial stratification. Um, how do systems work and how do they get reformed? Relations before transactions. You know what I'd like to do? I'd like to actually incorporate my response in that regard into the remarks that I'm going to be making later because I will be reprising to some extent my Lee lecture and extending some of the things that I have to say there and I think that might be the best place to do that. Uh, would that we had James Baldwin with us 
today. I frankly don't know what he would be saying. I'm moved to ask you about uh, that early essay of his, Everybody's Protest Novel, in which he takes Richard Wright uh, and Harriet Beecher Stowe to task for draining the agency and humanity out of the victims of slavery or racial oppression by presuming that these forces, these implacable, inexorably repressive forces that are holding people down have so stultified and so repressed and so stymied that we're only left to throw our hands up and lament. And he wants to say, no, 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 our burden is our life. There's still, you say optimism, there's something not only sort of uh, quixotic or you know, uh, utopian in the thinking about this optimism, there's a kind of existential stand that's being taken. It ain't over. It ain't over no matter what the history, no matter what the hand has been that we're still capable of making our own lives. So that's, those are my comments for the time being. I'll be again holding the floor shortly. say a place to start but not a place to end. A minor in the canary kind of analogies where you know this is what's happening with black people, you see it and it's really indicative of deeper systemic issues and so forth and so on. Uh, but I just caution. I, I don't like the phrase black crime. Mm. I don't like it. I don't know how you stop people from using it if you racialize this entire discussion. I don't like the phrase black crime. You know, I don't like calling attention to the murder rate in Chicago with the implicit inference that I thought black lives matter, but they gunned down black lives in New Orleans and Chicago every day and nobody's saying anything about it. Black crime is a threat, black issue. I don't like that. I don't like the racialization of the problem of the maintenance of social order. I don't know how you maintain that boundary if you're going to habituate yourself to the idea of thinking about these things in racial terms. So. You know, I, that's my unease. I mean, I'm not, I'm not clear entirely about what it is I recommend. I just want to try to convey a sense of disquiet with uh, the discourse and, uh, and a sense of kind of reflexivity and, you know, self-critical uh, assessment. And, and not assume that everybody's going along for the ride because, you know, everybody's not going along for the ride. I mean, I, I'll, I'll, go out, I'll go this far out on the limb. So there was a presidential election in 2016, you probably noticed. <laughs> uh, so during the primary campaign, the Democratic Party bring up onto the stage the mothers of the movement as a part of their, you know, affirmation of uh, their commitment to the value of black lives. And uh, I'm in, uh, maybe two days later, I'm in a restaurant in Providence, Rhode Island. Providence, Rhode Island is not Berkeley, California, uh, but it's not the Deep South either. It's, it's you know, a pretty progressive place, Brown University and so forth and so on. And I overhear somebody say at the next table, 
in reference to mothers of the movement say, if they'd been met better mothers, their kids would probably still be alive today. Mm. Um, uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so what am I doing here? I'm calling attention to reaction. I'm calling attention to the reactionary form. You know, I don't want young white men who don't have a job and who are dissatisfied with their social lives and uh, who are resentful about affirmative action or whatever, thinking about their whiteness as a defining feature of who they are in society. But if I'm constantly racializing public discourse, throwing their whiteness in, in their face, affirming my blackness as, a, as a, a marker of my status that has moral significance, I don't know how I keep them from doing it. I was actually really moved by what you just said because uh, there was someone who um, is now doing diversity training, but he was a former um, white hate person and he sang the songs. And he said, Some of the ways we talk about white people currently is actually exactly what you do to white people that have been, that might be wanted to join these groups, you know, the hate groups. Um, so it's interesting that you say that. But also, I think. Um, for me, when I hear Black Lives Matter, I was working in the inner city and I was working with some of the mothers that actually were up on stage. And I think some of them were feeling that, well, does the white, does the Black Lives Matter if the bullet didn't come from a police officer? And, mm. and that was a struggle I had because I, you know, I'm early on one of my students died and he wasn't killed by a police officer. And one of the things I think with the Black Lives Matter always strikes me. I mean, it's, you know, I think there's a lot to value and I'm not trying to, but I'm just saying it's a, it's a piece of the solution is maybe what I'm saying is the way of putting it. But I look at when black people are killed in the city, it, it often has to do with education it, and all the inequities. So police are only a piece of it. So if we had more jobs, you know, like in education, that's my frustration because I don't, I, I want to, police are so easy just to focus in that one area. And it's important, but it also like all the, all the inequities. Like that's one reason I I actually came here for something else, and I just happened to see the sign, and I'm thinking the persuasive per pervasiveness of inequities. And anyway, so okay. just wanted to say that. Thank you. Yeah, so I have to run and get my students in a second, so <laughs> I'll be back for the talk. But so yeah, so but I, I I was wondering if we could connect two different things here because one thing is like strategically. What do you do to create change and where you need the white allies and etc. Right? And another thing is this uh, empathy deficit. Right? So like when you say like Black Lives Matter, it's like stressing that there is a, a, an empathy deficit and what you could say is like an empathy surplus for white people, right? And so like um, and I think that the it, the sort of you know, let's reach out to a broader audience kind of approach, only has a really big problem as soon as you have an, an imperfect <laughs> candidate or an imperfect victim or, or, or something like this. So like you, like you see, like if you see, for example, the Colin Kaepernick protest or whatever, where you can really clearly see that there is this kind of, uh, it's it sort of, oh, well, you should like, you know, or the sort of shut up and dribble approach to, to, to basketball. Yeah. It's like this idea that, that it really portrays that certain people are only given what I would say sort of probationary citizenship, right? As, 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 as long as you, you perform uh, uh, perfectly, we can allow you into the group as soon as you show some kind of, uh, you know, frailty or, you know, combativeness or whatever, or assertiveness, you, you are excluded, right? And so, so for me, one of the positive things about Black Lives Matter is that it, um, it's in, in, it insists on the value, right? And it insists on, uh, on, on precisely the, 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 the sort of disparity of, like, of, of empathy, right? Like that, that, that there is a, a sort of um, different, but that's of course different than to say that you should use it uh, as a political strategy uh, for all purposes. Let me ask you a question. Suppose that uh, in the National Football League, 
uh, a bunch of Tim Tebow. I don't. Do you know who Tim Tebow is? Yes. Types <laughs> started wait, wait, who, who started this? taking a knee on the occasion of uh, the national anthem or the colors or whatever on behalf of a, a pro-life cause. Mm -hmm. I don't feel this is paraphrasing Colin Kaepernick that a country that uh, destroys human life in the womb with such frequency warrants to be respected. Well, as a what would, what would be your reaction? So to actually, that? I would think that would be wonderful because as a woman fighting for abortion rights in this country, that would stir a conversation that we really need to have, right? Which you would be hoping to so win at the expense male, of these. So if these, this male club of national football would do that, that would be amazing. <laughs> okay. I would point out they do do that. They do prayer circles all the time after every touchdown. Yeah. Exactly. So well, yeah, you know what I'm saying with the, 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 the edge, with the political the, edge of trying to tell people right. that they need to change the abortion laws or something like that. Right. No, I understand what you're saying about the the. Yeah, you but might I agree with the way yeah, I've seen those. They do that. They're, I mean, they're very conservative. That's their thing. I'll be right back. <laughs> 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 Can I just say something about the empathy question? I know Maria's gone. But I think we tend to think about empathy as something that happens, again, to use one of um, Professor Larry's phrases, as a transaction, but it's not. I mean, empathy is very incremental, and it takes many, many different instances of contact, and empathy can't be uh, forged in moments of crisis. I think empathy actually becomes forged over time when you meet people in non-crisis situations. And that's why it's so hard to cultivate it. Um, I mean, I know that when we, we read literature in the classroom with a view to stimulating empathy for a particular character or a particular group of people, um, it's just a little you know, sort of glimmer of it at the moment, even with really intense discussion. Um, and it's very easy to empathize with the character in a book, you know, in a piece of fiction. But you meet the very same type of character in real life, and you can just pass by that person and not give it a second thought. I mean, Elaine Scarry again writes about how you, you might go to see an opera about poverty and be moved to tears, right? The minute you leave the auditorium and come out and you see a homeless person sitting there, you just yeah. walk right by that yeah. individual. So I think empathy is really hard to cultivate, and you know that's one of the reasons that uh, it's got to be sort of repeated exposure, of, of repeated contact, and just very long-term labor. This is a really complicated, a really complicated issue. I just wanted to say that one aspect of the Black Lives Matter movement that I was particularly struck and moved by was the interracial nature of the demonstrations that were called for by the Black Lives Matter, you know, various chapters and, and uh, you know, people who did that calling for. I just hadn't seen that kind of interracial gathering of people from all different racial groups. Clearly, black people were leading this movement, and I thought it was good that non-black people were you know, on board with that leadership, but at the same time, it was really an interracial movement. And my sense is that the MB, the group that you said, the MAP, movement for Black Lives, has, has created a, a manifesto, or whatever you call it, that has much broader reach than just race. So it's, it feels to me like, in some way, the movement has already gone in a direction that you would approve of. That it is, it, it is trying to broaden beyond just a pure black focus. So, I mean, I, you know, the, the issue that you that you raised, Professor Lowry, you know, was in, in the Obama administration where he pushed this more universalistic and wouldn't ever want to talk about race specifically, and then. The Black Lives Matter movement sort of kind of challenged that in a way. And uh, I don't know. I mean, there is no simple solution to this issue, the strategic issue that my colleague, Professor Brinker, brought up. You know, how do you bring how do you bring the majority along? How do you get them to have the empathy as a street comes? But I feel that those those demonstrations were manifestations of that interracial 
sometimes uh, it's seen as a sort of panacea solution and flip side to uh, problems of stigma. And um, there's both a lot of research and a lot of historical cases where empathy is super fragile. Mm -hmm. So empathy, for example, depends on actual exposure and opportunity to see how other people live and cohabitation uh, with them. Um, you take something like the Rwandan genocide, you take something like the deterioration of relations in uh, Bosnia in the 90s, and these are people who are marrying each other, yeah. these mm -hmm. are business partners, drinking partners, yeah. uh, you know, sports teams, and in a very, in very quick order, it falls apart. It's fragile. But going to Rajni's uh, point, often what happens with these exposures is you say, that white guy, or that white guy, or that Israeli, or that Arab, they're great, but everybody else is not like them. So they're the exception to your ability to still maintain stigma. Or you can, you know, go away from one of these empathy producing meetings and say, oh, black people, black people are people too. Interesting. And that lasts for, you know, six months and then you revert. And so, I mean, that could just as well as dismissal of empathy argue for having more of these with more people. Um, but to me, one of the things that it points to is that in addition to empathy as the kind of flip side of stigma, you need something like, um, also a loaded word, a uh, tradition, a set of traditions of this is how we do things, and these are, this is what we accept, and this is what we don't accept. And that, that takes a very long time to sort of instill. We don't do certain things because it sort of challenges, destabilizes what we are as a team. Um, so, you know, Burke, for example, very, uh, I was just talking to Steve about this yesterday, Burke, very famous for reflections on the revolution in France, you know, uh, conservative manifesto, the other part of his work, the other part of his life, the later part of his life, the sort of disastrous end of his political career as he goes on this quixotic uh, impeachment of uh, Hastings, the, the chief of the East India Company, for how the natives are treated. Uh, and the argument is, this is not how we do things. The Burkean argument. Right, the Burkean argument. Which he loses. Which he completely loses, right, right. But it was an argument not only based on empathy, which it was, because he had spent time there, but also complemented by a sense of tradition, which I guess was not yet congealed enough in England at the time. Um, and there's, unlike empathy, there's no way to manufacture traditions. Uh, so that just takes time. So I just wanted to add something um, rather quickly. So although there's a lot of talk about empathy, I will just say that in terms of like my own understanding of Black Lives Matter, it's actually not a call for empathy to be created with allies. And then by that, I mean like, yes, if solidarity is actually created, that's something that's actually being done. So Black Lives Matter um, has supported Gaza, Palestinians in Gaza. They've supported Standing Rock. Um, they work with undocumented um, immigrants. So there is solidarity being done on the ground and interracially. So if a white um, individual is killed by a cop, such as in Utah, Black Lives Matter does call attention to that matter. And for me, the reason why I said empathy isn't the exact reason behind it because you also have to take into account the structure of power. Mm -hmm. It's not just the fact that people can't think of other people as human, can't think of African Americans as humanized, as someone that we can value. It's the fact that there's a political structure in place where power and violence can be done to people we devalue. And so I think Black Lives Matter, in calling attention, especially with the, their platform, has been like, how do we really go about changing the structure so that black lives not, can matter? Because right now, there is a valuation of black lives, but it's not had by all. So for me, it's in altering the structure, then you can get a situation where we can start thinking ethically about black people, where we can start valuing black people. Um, but I just wanted to say that rather quickly. So I think we should probably break. Uh,
a lot breaking down. We're about 15 minutes uh, after the time. Uh, let's give Professor Lowry a uh,